heart that hurts I want to spend my life Mending broken people I want to spend my life Mending broken people Hello and welcome to another 3ABN Today program. I'm Jason Bradley and I'm excited as we're going to dive into what a faith-based ministry is all about. Um, and here with me to discuss this is the co-director of SALT Ministries, Tim Maddox. It's great to have you here. It's nice to be here, Jason. Yes, yes. Now, I've had the opportunity to talk to you and find out a little bit about SALT and uh, what you've got going on in, in the world of ministry and how God has grown that ministry exponentially. I want to dive into that, but we're going to go to song first. And uh, we are going to hear from Pastor Wintley Phipps, and he's singing Amazing Love. Amazing love, how can it be? You broke the chains and set me free. You filled my life with joy untold. You light my spirit, you feed my soul. Now I want to let the whole world know of all you've done for me. I want to praise your name. Amazing love, how can it be? You sent your son to die for me. He took the blame, carried my shame all the way to Calvary. When I thought I was forever lost, you caught my falling soul I want to love you more Amazing love Amazing Amazing, amazing love, amazing love, how can it be you would give your life for me, you bring such comfort. To my soul, you raise me up and make me whole. Now I want to let the whole world know of all you've done for me. I don't think I could ever. Amazing 
amazing love how can it be now i live eternally i once was lost but now i'm found i was blind but now i see and now i am forever yours soon i'll see your face and i will love you more Amazing. What a powerful song, Amazing Love. Tim, I want to find out a little bit about your background. Where, where were you raised and were you raised in the church? Okay, so I was born in uh, England okay. in the sea town of Portsmouth, mm -hmm. but my father was in ill health and doctors recommended he move to a dry climate. Okay. So he moved our family to Australia, Perth, Australia. Okay. So I grew up in Australia, mm -hmm. count myself as an Australian. Okay. <laughs> uh, but at the age of 21, mm -hmm. just out of university, already married, my wife and I moved to Samoa, where I taught in an Adventist school for three years. Wow. And then to Fiji, where we, I taught for four, uh, two years, and then ran their school farm for two years. Wow. So you've traveled quite a bit. Yes. Yes. And where are you now? We're based in Cambodia. In Cambodia. And we've okay. been there for over 27 years. Okay, wow, 27 years. For the last 23 years, you've been running a supporting ministry in Cambodia, correct? Yes. Uh, how did you end up in Cambodia and starting Salt Ministries? So originally God called us to Cambodia through ADRA. And uh, with ADRA, I went there as a project manager. And my project was to help rice farmers improve their rice yields. Okay, okay. So that was the reason for going, but mm -hmm. when I got there, I realized that God had a different plan. Mm. I was to help the rice farmers, but when I arrived in Siem Reap, the town that I, I live in now, I realized that I was probably the only Christian in the town. Wow. And that my role there was more than just helping people grow rice. Hmm. It was helping them to know Christ. <laughs> amen, amen. Now, so you ended up staying there. Yeah, the project I worked on was uh, for three years. Okay. It ended up being extended to three and a half years. Okay. And in the last half a year or so, God began to speak to me in a, like an audible way during my worship times in the hmm. morning. And he began to say some really radical things. Mm -hmm. So he was telling me he wanted me to work full time for him. Mm -hmm and to move my family out into the countryside to mm. start uh, to plant a church where we move, uh -huh. to start a layman's training program to train new Adventists to be church planters. Wow. To use all of our life savings, about $20,000, to get that uh, ministry started. Wow. And not to ask anybody for money. There was one more thing. Uh -huh. He asked us to live like the local people lived, and the local people out there were poor. Really? Now, I guess the next natural question for me to ask you is, what was your wife thinking about this? She, when I shared her, with her uh, what I believe God was saying to uh -huh. me, her response was, God didn't tell me that. Really? <laughs> but we, She wasn't ready to embrace that yet. No, well, uh, it's a pretty radical move. <laughs> yeah. We had two small boys by this time. Oh, wow, yeah. So to take them out in the countryside, the countryside the, um, was still not safe. 
Yes. The Khmer Rouge went completely gone, mm -hmm. uh, and everybody had guns. Okay. So it wasn't really safe, uh, and you had to have no financial security. Yeah. Uh, just to take our family out and take our life savings and use it to make this happen. We weren't trained to do what we were being asked to do by God. Mm. So she really wasn't sure. But God reached her heart, mm -hmm. gave her a sign, mm -hmm. and she came on board. Oh, praise We've the Lord. We've been doing it ever since. Praise the Lord. How did your ministry look when it first began in 1996? Well, it was just the two of us and our two boys uh, in a little thatched house on a 42 acre piece of land. Wow. Uh, about three miles out of Siem Reap town. And we called one other Cambodian family that had come to know Christ through our ministry in the town, mm -hmm. to join us and help us. And so it was just this little tiny family ministry. Wow. And so what took place after you started that? How did it grow? Well, God, in his graciousness, mm -hmm. didn't tell us all that was going to happen. Uh -huh. <laughs> but we began by establishing the training program. Uh, we, didn't actually, we started the ministry in 1996. We didn't get the training program going until 1998. Okay. By this time, we'd built buildings. We'd fenced the compound, built a road into the property. Nice and began reaching out to the people in our community. Mm -hmm. So in 1998, we began our first training program. We just uh, ran a four-month live-in training program, wow. encouraged whole families to come and train, mm -hmm. and uh, we ran 12 programs altogether between 1998 and 2007. Okay. So about 400 people oh, going problems. through. 400 people. You, you said you started it with your life savings. Yes. Right? $20,000. All of the things that you just named sound like it amounts to more than $20,000 worth of... Yes. Well, we had to buy the land, and uh -huh. build the road, do the fencing, build the accommodation, etc. And that 20000 just shrunk very quickly. Yeah. So where did the rest come from? Well, God had given us the promise that he would provide all our needs. Mm -hmm. So Matthew 6, 33. Ah, I've got that open too. Do you want to read it? Yeah, I'll read it. Sure, absolutely. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be or shall be added to you. So we began resting, standing on that promise uh -huh. in 1996. Today, we're still standing on that promise, and God has never failed. So as we needed funds, funds would come. Mm -hmm. And God was leading us into a faith journey, yes. which meant we, we were learning to trust Him. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't very long before the vision for what we were there for began to grow. And people started coming to my wife, asking her, could she help them with medical needs? Hmm. And she had some basic medical training. So she began doing what she could to help them. Uh -huh. And that grew into a clinic and a bush hospital type thing. And over the next four years, she treated 6,000 people for all different uh, sicknesses. Wow. She's self-trained to be a midwife, delivered over 60 babies. Wow. Um, but that then began to open up new opportunities. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the, the local village leader had asked us mm -hmm. was to start a school. Wow. And so we started the school as a literacy school for the poorest of the poor in our community. Mm -hmm. One of our local converts, we employed her as our first teacher. She had grade two education herself. And so she was teaching 20 kids on a veranda how to read the Khmer language. And she had a second grade education? Second grade education. Wow. So how did, that, how did that work? It worked well because uh, she knew the difficulty of, of uh, language. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, but, but God had a much bigger vision in mind, gotcha. as he always does. Uh -huh. And if we don't limit God's vision, it'll grow. And so today that school is a K-12 to bilingual school. Wow. My first teacher, she still teaches, but now she teaches sewing in the school. Wow. And we have about just under 300 students. Wow. That's, that's a pretty full school out there. Um, you know, as a supporting ministry, how have you been accepted by the Cambodia Adventist uh, mission? This is 
something that's really a blessing in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. Our Adventist mission is very cooperative. Mm -hmm. When I first had the vision for the ministry that we do and the lay training, I went to the Cambodia Adventist mission president, mm -hmm. Pastor Daniel Walters, and told him what God had put on my heart, and he embraced the idea. And then as we looked at, as our ministry started to grow, we were training people, pastors were selecting who would come to train, mm -hmm. and then the mission was taking them and sending them out to be church planters. Wow. So we had this very close working relationship. Later with the school, we needed to register the school. Mm -hmm. We went to the mission and asked, could we register it under their foundation? Mm -hmm. And they agreed. We would operate it. They wouldn't have any say in how it ran, uh -huh. but it would be registered as a, a church entity. Wow. God also showed us that we were to run an orphanage. And so in 2003, we began an orphanage. And again, we registered that under the church foundation. And so throughout the years, we've had this very close working relationship. And our Cambodia Adventist Mission extends that relationship to all supporting ministries. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So there in Cambodia, we have this wonderful opportunity to just unite and work together as a team. Yes. So when we have a, the Cambodia Adventist Mission has a strategic planning session, Mm -hmm. They call all the heads of the supporting ministries to come in and contribute. Wow. And that way we're all on the same page. Yes. We're all working together mm -hmm. for a common goal. So our working relationship is excellent. Yeah, it sounds like a great working relationship. Um, and it's, you, know, you can really see how God is rewarding that walk of faith and the obedience that you had to the calling that he's placed uh, yes. on your life. I mean, that's exponential growth. Uh, right there. You, when you think about starting with $20,000 and then, you know, he's called you to, to st start a training center. Then you've got a school. Then you've got an orphanage. And I mean, there's just so many things that, that and so many different ways that he's grown the ministry. Yes. Uh, now, I know that, you know, God has been providing and on time. You don't ask for money do you? One of the things God told us was not to ask for money, mm -hmm. so just to pray. And again and again, God has stretched our faith mm -hmm. so that we've learned to trust Him and that we've seen miracle after miracle. So one of the um, amazing things is just feeding all these people. Mm -hmm. So at the peak of the orphanage's growth, we had 196 children in the orphanage. Wow. On top of that, we, our school has a dormitory. So we've got kids in the dormitory from Seventh-day Adventist families out in the countryside. They're too poor to pay mm -hmm. or to mm -hmm. pay very much. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was a time when we were supporting like over 240 kids. Wow. And we're just depending on God to provide that. Yes, and he always did on time. He always did. Yes. Always does. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Now, do you have any income generating operations? We have not had any income generating operations. In fact, <laughs> we added to uh, our program a media ministry. Okay. Inspired okay. partly by 3ABN. Praise the Lord. So we have a studio. Uh huh. Uh, we have a green screen, like your green screen here. Okay. Um, and we produce videos in the Khmer language. Oh, the, the Khmer language. Uh, that's uh, Cambodian. Cambodian. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. So we send them out to the different churches mm -hmm. through the Cambodia Adventist Mission to help support the evangelism they are doing. So <laughs> we're running school, orphanage, media center. And all of that is costing lots of money. I believe it. And we believe that Ellen White, uh, from what Ellen White said, that supporting ministries mm -hmm. should really be self-supporting mm. if possible. Yes. So we, for years we prayed for God to show us how we might become self-supporting. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed impossible given that Asia it's very cutthroat the way everybody works. There's not much markup. Gotcha. So it's hard to make money. Uh huh. But we live in a tourist town. Mm -hmm. So Siem Reap is the home to the Angkor Wat Temple Complex. Okay. 
and we get three million visitors a year. Hmm. And so tourism is the one area that you could make money. One day a friend came and he said, Tim, why don't you start a butterfly garden for tourists? Uh-huh. So, you, wow. So, like, we've got all of these things that we're doing and we're trusting God. Uh -huh. And now we have a potential way of making money, but it's going to cost money to make it happen. Wow. So I wasn't, I was skeptical. Mm -hmm. But I took it to God and God began to convince me this was what he wanted. So I sat down and roughed out some plans. Mm -hmm. I'm a biologist by training. Oh, really? And I had visited many butterfly gardens uh -huh. prior to the idea being given to me. And I roughed out some plans and came up with a figure of about $400,000. Wow. Wow. And it's like, God, we can't do this. We are living from day to day, yes, like the Israelites uh -huh. in the desert. Uh huh. And you want me to do a four hundred thousand dollar project? Yeah. Well, I said to God, uh, "You better give me a sign." Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And so I asked for something very simple. I asked to see one particular butterfly laying its eggs on its host plant. This is a butterfly project, uh -huh. so we can use butterflies as yes. a sign. And if God would allow me to crowdsource, mm -hmm. then I should see this butterfly laying its eggs. Wow. Well, that was over four years ago, and I have never seen that butterfly lay its eggs, even though <laughs> I've captured the female butterfly and put her in a cage with the host plant. Uh -huh. They just die. They won't lay eggs. Wow. And so I, I got a clear sign from God mm -hmm. that this was not his will for us to ask for funds to build this theme park. Wow. We had to trust him. Uh -huh. This was the next step on our faith journey. Wow. <laughs> so in 2016, mm -hmm. we have been praying that God would send us uh, a donor to help get started. We'd learned that we don't need all the funds. Other projects we've done, like building our television studio, mm -hmm. we just need a donation. Television studio, we got a donation for $200. So we started. Wow. 15 months later, we finished after spending 70000 and we never asked anybody for money. That is incredible. So we'd learned that that's how it works f for our ministry. Yes. And so we began praying, and God inspired a donor here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. who we didn't know, but mm -hmm. he had heard about what we were doing with orphans, mm -hmm. that he was willing to sell a townhouse and give the money for long-term support of the orphans. Wow, he sold a townhouse for long-term support of the orphans? So we, we asked him, well, or we told him, we've got this project we want to do and it's for the long-term su support of the orphans. Uh -huh. Would you be willing for us to use part of that money to toward this project, mm -hmm. as well as supporting the orphans. And he agreed. Wow. So when the money arrived, we began to build. Uh-huh. And it wasn't long before the money had gone. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. And uh, one of the things that I've struggled with th through my ministry mm -hmm. is the poor Christian mentality. Hmm. Elaborate on that. So as a, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, Often we, I feel like, oh, poor me. I look at mm. those with lots of money uh -huh. and I think, poor me. And uh, I've struggled with this and I know it's wrong mm -hmm. because we haven't got a poor father. Uh, we've got a rich father. That's right. And we've That's got a right. generous father. That's right. His problem is that we think, poor me. Uh huh. So when, we, when I designed the butterfly garden, which is one of the largest in the world, uh, I decided that we were going to go all out for the glory of God. Wow. It didn't matter what it cost. Mm -hmm. We were going to do it for the glory of God. That's right. And so uh, this new journey of faith began. And God has really, really blessed. Amen. Amen. And to, again, to go back to the initial $20,000 investment and then that growth and that growth and, you know, continuing to listen to the Lord and be obedient 
to what he's, he's calling you to do each time. And each time it's a walk of faith. Cause yes. you, you don't know where the money's coming from, but no. you know that God is going to provide. I now have over 80 people working for me. Wow. We're supporting all these kids in the orphanage and in the school. Mm -hmm. So we spend around 20,000 US dollars a month now. Wow. And we are just waiting on God to yes. provide. The miracle is that, uh, and it's a miracle that's happened in my heart. Mm -hmm. I don't stress about it. Mm -hmm. In fact, the closer the deadline gets to needing the money, the more excited I get. Yes. Because I know a miracle is about to happen. Amen. And coming here to the United States, we saw miracle after miracle happen. How, how, how long was your flight coming here to the United it, States? I had four flights with a okay. total traveling time of 44 hours. 44 hours. Yes. That is a long, long time. But, okay, so I, I, I want to go back uh, to the Butterfly Garden. Yes. You said it's one of the largest in the world? Yes. Wow. We actually have a video of the Butterfly Garden. Uh, let's take a look at that. Yep. The amazing journey here at Butterfly Paradise continues. In December of 2018, we opened the doors to the public. Not yet finished, but the garden, it's beautiful. The waterfalls are working. There's fish in the ponds, there's crocodiles, there's cr turtles, there's rabbits, there's birds. It's, and of course, there's butterflies. It's a great place for people to come and visit. Uh, just recently we brought the cinema online so visitors are now able to move into the air-conditioned cinema to get out of the heat and enjoy videos that focus on God as creator. Soon the restaurant will be finished, the educational area will be finished, the small animal house will be finished and the souvenir shop and we'll be able to open to the public fully and ad advertise it in a big way and we'll see lots of people coming in to enjoy the beauty here and to learn about God as their creator. A butterfly Paradise was created with three primary goals. One of the goals is to raise funds to support the orphanage and the schools that we operate. The second goal is to help people experience God through creation, through the design in nature. And the third goal is to give our young people here that are coming out of school, coming out of the orphanage uh, with professional work experience before they move on to other jobs elsewhere. In addition to Butterfly Paradise, we are in the process of setting up a souvenir workshop where young people can use their hands and the creativity that God has given them to create little masterpieces that we can sell in our souvenir shop and thus generate more income, income for them and income for our mission of supporting the orphanage and school. In addition, we are also building uh, and almost finished a tropical plant nursery so that local visitors coming to Butterfly Paradise, they see all the beautiful plants in here and think they'd like to have them in their garden. So they can go to the other end of the car park and purchase those plants and take them home and make a little bit of paradise in their garden as well. A lot of people have been praying for this project. It's a faith-based project. It's not quite finished yet. And we would invite you to join us in prayer Pray that God will send the funds that we need to finish and also pray that God will send the visitors because without them we can't tell them about him and without them we won't generate the income that we need to support the orphanages and the schools. You could also promote Butterfly Paradise, share the uh, news about this wonderful place with your friends and you can like us on Facebook and in TripAdvisor as well.
That is a beautiful, beautiful place. Do you ever have like a devotion there? I go there a lot uh -huh. just to enjoy the presence of God. Mm -hmm. um, I sneak in there after everybody's left in the evening, uh -huh. go and sit next to a pond and feed the fish nice. and just, just relax knowing that God created all this beauty mm -hmm. to bring joy to my heart. Yes, yeah, it seems like a very peaceful, yes. peaceful place. Uh, you've been walking in faith for so long. What lessons can you share uh, about your, your walk in faith? God is an extravagant God. Mm -hmm. You can see that when we look at, look at nature, when you mm -hmm. look at the butterfly and the colors. Um, and God wants to extravagantly pour out his love and blessings upon us. Mm -hmm. But often we restrict him mm. because we don't trust him. We don't, We don't ask. Mm -hmm. It's that poor me type of thing. The poor me, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think of the, the story of the lost son, we usually focus on the lost son in that story, but there's the older brother. Mm -hmm. And when the lost son comes home, the older brother's all upset and says, well, why didn't you, why have you never given me a party? Hmm. And the father says, everything I have is yours. Wow. You never asked. Yeah, yeah. And as God has led us on this, this faith journey, mm -hmm. we've realized that we don't receive because we don't ask. Mm -hmm. And often we don't receive very much because we don't ask for very much. Yes. If we will ask for the glory of God, He's going to give it to us. Amen. In, in John chapter 15, Jesus says, ask whatever you desire and I'll give it to you. Now that, that could be taken the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, it could. <laughs> it could. But before that, he says, abide in me. There we go. Uh -huh. So if we're abiding in Christ, what we're going to ask for would be what Christ would desire. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so through this faith journey, we've been learning if we desire what God wants, mm -hmm. if we ask, he'll give it to us. Yes. So he's given, he gave us a lay training program mm -hmm. and he's given us hundreds, maybe thousands of souls mm -hmm. as a result, mm -hmm. as people have gone out and shared the gospel. He gave us an orphanage and as a result of that, we've had a lot of kids. Yes. <laughs> through. The orphanage, he gave us the school and, and again, it's We've learned to, to trust him, mm -hmm. but it's been growing. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to think of it like a piano. The piano is like the faith of Jesus. It's a gift that God gives us, but I have to learn to play. Yes. And the more I practice, the better I get at mm -hmm. making that, that piano produce a beautiful sound. Mm -hmm. So the more I practice using the gift of faith that Jesus gives us, the better I get at using it. Yes. And, and God has, has, is still teaching us. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought Butterfly Paradise, once it, once it was finished, we get a lot of tourists and we would move from being faith-based to being uh, self-supporting. Mm -hmm. And that worried me because mm -hmm. I enjoyed living by faith. Yes. But uh, it hasn't gone there yet. <laughs> well, it's, it sounds like you're getting a little extension. It's still uh, not finished. And so God is, is, is extending my faith. Yes. So now on top of everything that we are doing, we are also by faith supporting the operation of Butterfly Paradise. And we're establishing these other uh, industries. And so God has really stretched us to the next level. Mm -hmm. And... I appreciate God for doing that Amen. because it's a constant learning, yes. and realizing if I would just trust God 100%, mm -hmm. he would do far greater than he's already done. Absolutely. Now, with the orphanage, what happens with the orphans as, as they continue to grow older? Um, I know that I talked to you previously, like prior to this interview, 
and we were discussing what happens when they get a little bit older. Well, when the orphans come in, they uh, can stay in the orphanage until uh -huh. they're ready to leave, uh -huh. assuming that they're keeping the rules. Yes. And so we have some orphans that are in their 20s uh -huh. and they're still studying or they still need to be there for various reasons. Mm -hmm. But our goal is to give them an education, equip them to serve God, and then where possible, give them work. Nice, so you provide them with the opportunity to serve God too. Yeah, so as God has been inspiring us to grow the ministry, uh -huh. He's been through these young people coming out of the orphanage and school, supplying us with a workforce mm -hmm. of young, enthusiastic people. Yes. And so I said we have over 80 people working for us. The majority of those 80 people have actually come through the orphanage and school. Wow. And so for me, that's really exciting mm -hmm. because as I invest my life in these young people, my reward is to see them growing up and using their skills and talents to serve yeah. the Lord. Yes, and, and I think that a, a certain level of passion comes along with that because, you know, they were an orphan at one point. They experienced that and, and how much uh, help or how much value it added to their uh, life. And so now they want to share that with others that are coming through yes. as well. How has this journey impacted your family? My wife, her name is Wendy, mm -hmm. and I came to Cambodia with a strong faith in God and with two small boys. Mm -hmm. So we raised our boys to be Cambodian. Okay. And what, do you, and, and what do you mean by you raised them to be Cambodian? What do you mean by that? Well, a lot of missionaries, and this is not wrong, but a lot of missionaries mm -hmm. see their children back in the home country. Oh, uh, okay, gotcha. And having a future in the home country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We wanted to see our children as missionaries. Okay. And we put no time frame on when our service for God will end as missionaries. That's up to God. That makes sense. So we decided that what would be great if we're still in the mission field, if our children are in the mission field with us when they grow up. Mm -hmm. So we raised them to speak the Cam Cambodian language, to read and write. They went to school, they learned it, and to interact with the local people so that they were their own. Mm -hmm. So I guess it was logical that eventually our children would fall in love with local <laughs> girls. We have two yeah. boys. Uh -huh. And so that's what happened. They fell in love and they've married local girls. Nice. The local girls were on staff and had been through our school and one of them through the orphanage. Mm -hmm. um, so now they and their spouses work together with us wow. in the ministry. We also took a young girl, seven-year-old girl, into our home mm -hmm. when her parents had died. And so we raised her as our own Cambodian girl. Mm -hmm. And so she's grown now, married, and her and her husband work for us as well. Wow. Uh, so she manages our souvenir industry. Okay. And the, her husband manages our plant nursery. Okay, okay. And, and so for us as, as missionaries, it's an amazing opportunity because we have all our children living around us, working together with us yes, in the ministry. Which is beautiful. You know, there, there are so many things that are vying for our attention uh, nowadays. And even back a couple years ago and years before that, what lessons did you instill in your children? I'm not sure that we actually tried to instill them. Mm -hmm. But it, it just came naturally mm -hmm. because our lives uh, are based around serving others. Mm -hmm. And so it was just natural to involve our children in, in serving others as well. And so they, they've adopted that as their lifestyle practice to live their lives in the service of others. Amen. And God has blessed them with skills that complement our skills, uh -huh. our staff skills, so that we can all work together as a team, hi, uh, working in different areas of the ministry, mm -hmm. but growing the ministry for the glory of God. And he's blessed each one of them with a help meet. Yes. Yes, yes, so now they have a wife that can yeah. assist in the ministry as well. And my grandchildren live next door. 
Nice, <laughs> nice. So <laughs> you're a close family. Yes. Yes, wonderful. Uh, what vision has God given you for the future uh, of your ministry? So many years ago, while we were on a Pathfinder camp mm -hmm. out near what they call a mountain, what you would call a hill. <laughs> okay. I, I felt this strong impression by God that we should have a health retreat mm -hmm. to minister to the rich Cambodian people who are suffering from lifestyle disease. Mm. And God spoke to me in such a way as to say, I want this piece of land for the health retreat. Uh -huh. But he went beyond that and he said, I want that piece of land for a, a campground. Wow. At that time, that didn't seem possible mm -hmm. for various reasons. But God put all the pieces of the jigsaw together so that today we own those, well, I say we own those two properties. Uh, the Cambodia Adventist Mission owns those two properties. Okay. And here, that's something I'd like to highlight. When our ministry buys land, we give it to the Cambodia Adventist Mission. Hmm. So they own it and we develop it for them. Nice. So we have this property and uh, once the work on Butterfly Paradise uh -huh. is, is completed and the other industries are functioning properly, uh, then I hope to turn my attentions to developing this health retreat nice. where we can reach out to the, the rich Khmer people. Yes, yes. Um, how do you determine, and, and now I want to shift to church planting, how do you determine where to plant a church and what's that process like? With uh, the church planting that our, our church planters, the ones we trained, have done, we ask them to pray about it. Ask them to pray where would God like to send them. Mm -hmm. And so each of them were praying and they submitted to us where they felt God would lead them to go. Mm -hmm. And so we sent them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it seemed crazy. Um, one couple who were barely literate been through our four months training program. I asked them, where do you want to go? They told me a place about 25 miles away, which was pretty hard to get to at that time because the roads were so bad. This wow. was 1999. So I said, okay, there's not many people live out there. It's uh -huh. very poor, uh -huh. but he had one relative there. So we, we sent them and they began church planning. Now, like I said, they were barely literate. Mm -hmm but they believed in spiritual gifts and they believed in the gift of healing mm -hmm. and in the gift of deliverance. Yes. And so they ministered to the people in those villages there by praying over the sick and seeing miracles mm. and by casting out evil spirits. Wow. So in this rather remote village, <laughs> they planted a church and today we've added to what they've done by adding a school. So wow. we have a three classroom school there and they have a, a, a nice church building now mm -hmm. and the church is growing. Uh, so back when we asked them where would they like to go, mm -hmm. it seemed like a foolish place to go, but we'd ask them to pray and let God lead them. Yes. And so now we have a church there and from that church has grown two more churches. Wow. So we can see that Sometimes the wisdom of God is not the wisdom of man. <laughs> yes, <laughs> oftentimes that's the case. <laughs> and it's evident that God was leading um, as they, they picked that particular location yes. to do the church plant. I pers well, we personally benefited from that because one of our daughter-in-laws came out of that church plant. Oh, this story <laughs> gets better and better. <laughs> wow. So. Okay. Um, how many people go out, like for a church plant? Typically? Usually they would be sent in twos. Twos, okay. And the way we were doing it was families, so husband and wife. Okay. We were training husband and wife to work together as a ministry team. Nice. What does a day in your life look like? Because there's been so many different things, school, orphanage, um, a training program, a butterfly garden. What does a day in your life look like? There is no typical day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I would begin the day with my devotions, mm -hmm. have breakfast with my wife, and then be at the school by 7 o'clock in the morning for staff worship. Okay. After staff worship, I may remain around the school for a while, mm -hmm. or I may go off 
to do other things. Yes. Uh, so throughout the day, I would be uh, meeting with my staff in different areas, making sure they know what they're doing, have what they need to make things happen, discussing plans mm -hmm. together with them. Obviously, for the last four years, Butterfly Paradise has taken a lot of my time mm -hmm. uh, working with the builders and working with staff and students on planting it, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, there's time with the media people. Yes. Uh, and I also do the electrical work, so any, any electrical problems I'll fix. Wow. And one of my hobbies uh -huh. is extracting teeth. <laughs> So at any point in my Extracting day... Extracting teeth is one of your, your hobbies? Yeah. Like from humans or... From or, humans, or yes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I got a day and a half's training uh -huh. with a dentist once and learned how to do the injections and extract the teeth. Yeah. And so now village people will show up at any time of day with painful teeth and Very ask nice. me to help them out. So usually what I'll do is just lay off whatever I'm doing then and go and pull their teeth and go back to what I was doing. Wow. So my day has a lot of variety. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'll say, I mean, you just, you just went from church planter to tooth extractor. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of variety there. Yeah, sure. it could be you know, doing electrical work to pulling a tooth, yep. to rushing off to teach a class. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. There's never a dull moment. No. Never a dull moment. And never does the list of things to do get any shorter. Yes, yes. <laughs> what would you say that you enjoy the most about ministry? I think the most rewarding thing is to, to see people that we've loved into the kingdom of God mm -hmm. love other people into the kingdom of God. Yes. And just to see the passion that we have for telling people Jesus is coming, mm -hmm. to be passed on, mm -hmm. and see that passion being passed on. Yeah, continuing to pay continuing. it forward. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, you know, I don't get a paycheck, so I don't get up every day to go and go out and work because I need money. Yes. I get up every day and go out to work because I'm excited about serving the Lord. Amen. This is purpose driven. Yes. Yes. And, and so when I see the fruit of that, mm -hmm. it brings joy. Amen. What are some of the needs of the ministry? Finance is always a need. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. People. People. So we get a lot of, uh, we need volunteers to help teach in our school mm -hmm. and do other things. So currently we have seven volunteers. They come from all over the world. Most of them are self-supporting volunteers as well. Oh, wow. They may have year 12 education mm -hmm. or they may have a university degree. We don't really mind because we believe in spiritual gifts yes. more than degrees. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, yes, we need people and we need prayer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Prayer definitely changes things. Yes. For sure. Um, what would you say to someone who wants to get involved in ministry but's kind of on the fence? I would say if you hear God speaking, please do not say no. Mm -hmm. Just follow the leads that God is giving you mm -hmm. because God has got an amazing ad adventure for your life. Yes. I can see that in my own life. Yes. And if you would just follow God's plan, mm -hmm you're going to have an amazing adventure and do things you could never have imagined you could be doing. Amen. And how did you discover your purpose in life? By f making my life available to God. Mm -hmm. So both my wife and I, we decided we will go anywhere, do anything for any length of time. Mm -hmm. God calls the shots. And the purpose of my life, I guess, the primary purpose has been to be where God wants me to be, doing what God wants me to be doing. Amen. Through that, I've learned so many other things. Yes. Yeah. What are some signs that you're walking in your purpose? Like, how do you recognize once you've arrived in the purpose that God has set forth for your life? The joy mm -hmm. that you feel, the miracles that you see, mm -hmm. um, the transformation in other people's lives. Yes. And your, 
your fam your wife, she deals with medical missionary. She teaches medical missionary work. She work, teaches okay. uh, nutrition. Okay. Uh, cooking. Oh. And she does the medical manages the medical side of our ministry. Okay. Uh, patching up the kids in the orphanage mm -hmm. and doing first aid for the community now if they need it. Uh, and, and she and I work together as co-directors of the ministry. So nice. whoever says something, that goes. Nice, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, you know, we're going to get ready to go to a short news break. And after the news break, we will be right back. You know, shortly before the break, we talked about, you know, what are some of the needs of the ministry? Um, well, we didn't talk about how people can get in touch with you. Yes, yeah, so the best way to get in touch with me is uh, through email. Okay. And if people want to come and volunteer, mm -hmm. they can just email me. Okay, what's your email address? The email address is tim at saltmen.org. Okay, tim at saltmen.org. Okay. Um, yeah, if they would like to make a donation, they can contact us. We'll let them know how's the best way to make a donation. Mm -hmm. If they're visiting Siem Reap to visit the Angkor Wat temples or for some other reason, uh -huh. we'd love to have them come out on Sabbath okay. and worship with us. We're happy to give them a tour around our campus to nice. show them what God has done. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we'd love them to come and visit Butterfly Paradise. Yes, yes. Now, you've had a nightmare. Yes. Let's transition into that. What, what was your nightmare about? Well, after doing ministry for the Lord for nearly, well, 34 years, mm -hmm. I can look back on what God has done with my life mm -hmm. and how He's used my life to influence people for the kingdom of God. And sometimes I start to reflect and think, what if I had said no mm. to God? What if I had followed my dream for my life mm -hmm. rather than God's dream for my life. And when I start to think about that, I see a whole lot of things very differently. Mm -hmm. uh, if we think about the orphanage, I see a whole lot of kids that wouldn't have had that care. Yes. Particularly the HIV kids that we've cared for in our orphanage because they weren't wanted in other orphanages. Yeah. They probably would have died. Mm -hmm. um, all these kids that wouldn't have got education like they have now. They would have been out caring for the cows mm -hmm. and uh, that would be their, their life job unless they're working on a building site. But now they're going to university, getting education, mm -hmm. teachers, accountants, yes. uh, those sorts of things. So if I'd said no to God, it would have changed the lives of a lot of people mm -hmm. in a negative way. Yes. Um, if I had said no to God, a lot of people wouldn't heard, have heard the gospel. Hmm. Because we said, yes, we would do this lay training. Mm -hmm. Yes, we would put all of our financial resources into making this ministry happen. Yes, we would trust God. We train these 400 people. Mm -hmm. Some of those are pastors today. Wow. Many of them are church planters still. Wow. And they have brought hundreds, thousands to Christ. Mm -hmm. If we hadn't done that training, maybe God wouldn't have found somebody else mm -hmm. and those people wouldn't have known God. Wow. So that's why I say it's like a nightmare yes. to think, God, if I had said no, all these people wouldn't be in your kingdom. Yes. And that's a pretty frightening thing. It is a pretty frightening thing, you know, but praise the Lord that you answered the calling that he placed on your life. You know, there are a lot of people that have probably given their hearts to the Lord as a result. And uh, like you said, there's, there's those that are employed as a result of you answering the calling yes. that God has placed on your life. Thank you so much for Thank you so much. sharing with us today and, and what you're doing in ministry. Until next time, God bless. <laughs>